institutions and pass out in flying colors. On behalf of Tane Sangati, I welcome Brother Shashan Shah, also known formally as Dr. Shashan Shah, who has completed his PhD and uh, he's a doctorate by qualification and he's been associated with various educational institutions both in India and abroad. He's published several research papers and uh, he's uh, involved in lots of case studies. But most importantly, he's here today with us to share Swami's message and some experiences of his. So without further delay, I request Brother Shasham to come and address the audience. Shri Sairam, offering our loving pranams at Swami's lotus feet. My warm greetings to everyone on the auspicious festival of Guru Purnima. And thanks to the Thani Samiti for inviting me here. While it's just an extended part of Mumbai, but it takes about 100, 150 minutes one way to travel back and forth. So that's how this part of the country has grown. I was just thinking when Swami first came to Mumbai in 1962 and today in 2018, how much of Mumbai has grown and how much of Sai devotees and the Sai movement and mission in Mumbai has grown is seen from the large number gathered here to participate in the Guru Purnima festival. So thank you very much for having me here. I hope everybody is comfortable with English. Uh, if you want, I can speak in Hindi and Marathi and Gujarati and a little bit of Telugu also. But if everybody is comfortable with English, I will manage in English. Right? Okay. So I have divided my talk into two parts. I have about 45-50 minutes. So the first part is to highlight the glory of our Guru, what he is, what he stands for what his message and mission are all about. And the second part of the talk focuses on what we have to do, what we can do, what we should do as our homage, as our gratitude, as our offering to the Master who has accepted us into his mission, to his fold, to make our lives more meaningful, more purposeful. So I'll start with the first part in trying to emphasize and analyze Swami's life in brief. So it goes back to 1947 when Swami wrote that letter to his brother. Very often we are so overwhelmed with Swami's divinity and with Swami's life that we rarely make an effort to analyze it. What all did Swami do in his life? What is What are the distinguishing aspects of Swami's life that he has lived which we should understand, analyze and then invite in our lives? So I will try to classify Swami's life so that we can get in some distinguishing features into our understanding and then learn from that. So the letter that Swami had written to his brother in May 1947, Swami highlighted three key objectives of his avatar mission. He had written in Telugu, I will identify them and then I will translate it. And then we will take it forward from there. So he said, Akhila manavalaku anandam nagurchi, rakshin chuchurute nikshama. It is my vow to ensure lives full of ananda for all mankind. Sanmargavana vidi charin chuvarala chepatti kapaadne patamuna All 
those who have left the path of path of righteousness and moved away, it is my task to hold their hand and bring them back. And the third one he said, be the sadhana kaina, penubada toligiche, lemi bhavate premana. To remove the sufferings of the poor, of the forlorn, and give them joy is a task which I love to do. So if we analyze Swami's life, these are the three key objectives, the three, three key mission statements that he placed before himself way back when he was just 21. Most of us at 21 are busy working for our TYB comp examinations, TYB, TYBAC, engineering, medicine, whatever course we choose. Here was Swami at the age of 21, giving a mission statement that he has an objective of transforming all mankind, of giving joy to all mankind, of removing suffering of all mankind. Now this was not something he was going to do by himself, but he gave each one of us that opportunity to be a part of that mission and join him in this grandiose mission that he laid before us. In, in one of his conversations with Brahmanand Panda, who was the state president of Odisha, Swami said that I have divided my life into six phases. The government of India's planning commission has five year plans. Swami said I have predominantly divided my life into 16 year plans. So we will see how these 16 year plans unfolded. It started with the first 16 years from 1926 to 1942, which was a phase Swami himself called Leela. We have learned and read about the lives of great avatars, of Rama, of Krishna, of prophets like Buddha, Mahavira. All of them, the early years were dedicated to the family. They give joy to the family, to the friends and people in the, in the vicinity. And we see how so many sweet moments that Swami used to share about his experiences of the experience of Ishwarama and Padavan Kamaraju, his grandfather with Swami. How Swami used to stay with his grandfather and early in the morning before going to school, cook food for his grandfather, cook rasam for his aging grandfather, the fragrance of which used to bring villagers to his home and he used to give that to everybody. And Swami used to tell students in the Prashant in Portico that it was no ordinary rasam, it was medicinal rasam which used to cure many a diseases for those who used to partake of it. So there were so many small small things that Swami did in those 16 years as a child. But Swami also set an example as an ideal grandson, as an ideal son, as a brother. If we see and study Swami's life and I highly encourage those who haven't read to read Satyam Shri Sundaram in those early years, how Swami was an ideal grandson. When he used to stay with his grandfather, he used to take care of his grandfather's requirements before going to school, after coming back from school. Every aspect of his life was surrounded around his duty towards his grandfather. But at the same time, he was an extraordinary student. So you have to, as a student, as a Balvika student, we need to balance the best of our lives between the family and our duties as a student. As a student, Swami was not limiting himself to books. He was a great musician. He was a great dancer. He was a great dramatist. He was a great sportsman. So if you see what did Swami show in his early years, he showed the importance of being an all-rounder. Have you ever analyzed Swami's life in this way and seen what we can learn from Swami's childhood years? For those Balvikas gurus who would be teaching students, these are examples that would highlight what is it that we can learn from Swami as a young man, as a, as a, as a student in school. For example, when he was staying with his brother in Urvakonda, he used to go all the way few kilometers to fill water and bring it back. And then when the neighbors came to him and said, this is not your job, you have to go to school, your brother's family should take care of these requirements, he said, no. It is my opportunity to serve my brother's family. My sister-in-law is in the family way. She is going to get a child. Isn't it my job as a younger brother-in-law to take care of the well-being of the family in which I am staying? You see the subtle nuances of what ideal spiritual life is all about. So these were the years of Leela's, the first 16 years. Then we go to the next 16 years, Mahima. From 1942 to 1958, Every possible 
pilgrimage center Swami visited across the length and breadth of India from Dwarka and Somanath all the way to Badri and Kedar, all the way to Ayodhya, Mathura and down south, all the way to Kanyakumari. Every possible pilgrimage place Swami visited in Pandharpur. We have the famous experience in Pandharpur when Swami went inside the Sankam Santoram and materialized the Mangar Sutram for Rakhmai and then placed it around the neck of Rakhmai, the right of fish he alone has to offer a Mangar Sutra to Rakhmai. So that is the kind of Mahimas we saw in different parts, the beautiful idol of Krishna that he materialized in the sands of Dwarika. For those who could not have Dasha inside the temple at Dwarika, Swami materialized that idol of Krishna from the sands of the shores of the Arabian Sea outside Dwarika. There in Badri where he went, he materialized the Nendra Lingam which Adhashankaracharya 1500 years ago had placed below the idol of Lord Badri Narayana. He had got the five Nendra Lingams from Lord Shiva himself from Kailasha and one of them were placed below the idol of Lord Badri Narayana. So we see Mahima, the glory of the avataric mission spreading across different parts of India and Swami moving all over India trying to show the divine, the divine power that he embodied and trying to communicate what he truly stands for. We know the experience 1963 when on the same Guru Purnima day Swami cured himself of paralysis. This is a fantastic chapter in Satya Mishan Sundaram part 1 which I encourage everybody to read as to how Swami had predicted that he would be accepting the disease of one of his ardent devotees and for the seven days thereafter he suffered not only acute paralysis but suffered from four heart attacks, cerebral thrombosis and Dr. Prasanna Simha Rao who was the chief medical advisor to the government of Mysore came all the way to Patpati and said it is unfortunate that such a glorious life will soon come to an end. Little did he know that a few days later on Guru Purnima day Swami was brought down in a chair from his room downstairs to the Prashantilam Bhajan Hall and Swami took a few drops of water and sprinkled it on himself and there he stood up absolutely fresh as a rose out from the garden and delivered his discourse and declared what his true identity was as Shirdi, Satya and Premasa. So we see this Mahima, these glorious miracles, these larger than life experiences that he gave to devotees of that era. The problem is that all of us pause there and say yes, this is what we like. Like the Krishna of Gopal Vrindavan who had lifted up the Govardhan mountain we enjoy the Mahimas of those years and say, yes, this is the Swami we want to talk about. We don't want to go ahead. But Swami left that at the age of 32 and moved ahead. In 1958 to 1974 was the next phase of Upadesh. After having communicated what he is and what he stands for, the real thing started, giving the message. And that is very important for us to analyze because very often we limit Swami to miracles. Swami is man of miracles as our Murphy's famous book says. So for all the things that we enjoy about Swami, miracles are the most favorite. But Swami always used to say that miracles in my avataric vision are equivalent to a mosquito on the back of an elephant. That minuscule and insignificant is the role of miracles in Swami's life. Unfortunately, we have not been able to grasp and adapt to this message of Swami. Swami always used to say, miracles are my visiting cards. Have you ever analyzed why Swami said that? I also didn't analyze, I used to say this very often. But few years ago, I realized when I started giving my visiting card, I realized why Swami said, miracles are my visiting cards. When do we give visiting cards for all the professionals here on both sides? When we meet someone the first time. We introduce ourselves with a visiting card so that person knows us, we know them, that's it. <coughs> Second time when we meet the same person, do we give a visiting card? No. Sometimes we may give by mistake, we may forget that we have given it last time. So we give it this time again. Third time again if we give visiting card, the other person will think that there is some problem up here. This man has, this woman has extra visiting cards. He and she wants to distribute and show off whatever position he holds. When Swami said miracles are my visiting cards, he meant I only introduce who I am. 
through my miracle to you so that you know who, whom you are face to face with. Having done that, having introduced myself and my divinity to you, that role of a miracle in the life of a devotee concludes. After that, the real work begins. So the real work begins after we have realized Swami's divinity. But the problem is, we want that visiting card from Swami every time. If we don't get it, we demand it. If we don't get after demanding, we go elsewhere. But miracles is what I want all the time because that gives me a special stature in Swami's mission. I'm a chosen devotee. Hence, there are miracles in my house. That house there are miracles, my house there are not miracles. So, competition. You see how we bring down divinity to a sense of selfish requirement. This may not be the case with us, but what I observe usually is what I share. So the third phase in Swami's life is Upadesh. We may not have analyzed, but in Swami's lifetime, He has given 5,000 discourses across the length and breadth of India. There is no category of society which Swami has not addressed. Whether it is Prime Ministers and Presidents of India with the Union Council of Ministers, or it is the scientists at the Baba Atomic Research Center, whether it is Vice Chancellors at the topmost universities in India, or it is lawyers, or it is the police force, or it is the armed forces when you went to Kashmir. There is no aspect of professional public life that Swami has not catered to through his message. 5,000 discourses that Swami has given across the length and breadth of India, communicating the essence of what Bharatiya Samskruti and the Sanatana Dharma are all about. Swami always used to say when he went to Africa also, he said, I have not come to start a new religion. I have come to repair the ancient highway leading man to God. Which means what? Highway existed. He has come to repair it. You see how each sentence that Swami used to say is so pregnant with meaning. The highway existed. He has come to repair it. And the objective is to make the Hindu a better Hindu, the Muslim a better Muslim, the Christian a better Christian. There is no need to do anything new. There is only a need to reconnect with our roots so that we realize who we are. So that was the objective and that was the time to spread this Upadesh that Swami started the Sadasai Seva organization. To spread this Upadesh, Swami started the Central Trust. All of these institutions have played an important role in this larger picture. Then we go to the next phase, the next 16 years. The, the, the first week, Vidya, 1972 to 1974 to 1990. This is the time when Swami started all his education institutions, the colleges, the Bal Vikas program, the Sai Spiritual Education program overseas, and then to cap it all, he started the university. Why? Because it was Lord Macaulay who in the 1800s said that the best way to destroy Indian culture is by breaking the backbone of that culture, which is the education system. The moment we make Indians British in thinking and British in attire, we would have won over the civilization that India is so proud of, which goes back 5,000 years. Swami decided to resuscitate this particular core of Indian culture and civilization, which is the education system. The education system where degrees are not important, character is more important. And that's why Swami said the end of education is character. Today, if we see the best of the institutions in the world, and I had the opportunity of associating and working for some of them, suffer from the, the, the graduates of those institutions suffer from depression, suicidal tendencies, tension, pressure, all the things that we have associated with the lesser educated people are seen in the most educated people from some of these institutions. And what is the reason for that? The reason for that is the fundamental objectives of life are not communicated in the foundational years. So Swami said in his educational institutions, he would not only be catering to the body, he will be catering to the mind and to the soul. Because an individual is not just the body. The body is the hardware. The mind is the software. 
and the soul is the electric power which gives the hardware and the software the strength to sustain itself. And you see how that education mission has panned out. Today we have 100 Satisai schools across India with 50,000 students and 40 more Satisai schools in 26 countries. All of these communicating the message of education being for life, not for merely earning a living. The next phase from 1990 to 2006 is the phase of Vaidya, health. The two key aspects of individual life, education and health. If we see our scriptures have also said that, Acharya Devo Bhava, teacher is equivalent to God and Vaidya Narayana Vini, that the doctor is verily God himself. Why? Because the education and health care are the two prerequisites for a good life. So, Vaidya was the next key critical element of Swami's mission and we see how Swami redefined what healthcare is all about. In olden times, healthcare was supposed to be a matter of veneration. The Vaidya used to come to the house and out of his learning of the Ayurvedic text, cure whatever diseases that, are, that you are suffering. As civilizations have moved ahead and the Western influence have come into India, we have seen that the patient has become a bed number. Bed number so and so, medicine time, bed number so and so, food time. The individual is no longer a person, he is a bed number and that bed number has to be treated. Swami said no. The Satisai Healthcare Institutions will give humanized healthcare which do not charge a single Naya Paisa. So why don't you charge money when everybody can afford, why shouldn't you pay? Someone suggested to Swami. Swami, why don't we have subsidized healthcare like some institutions have? Those who can pay will pay. Those who cannot pay will get free. No force. Swami said, do you think I am giving healthcare and education free of cost? Because people cannot afford it? Yes, that is one of the reasons as he announced in 1990, November 22nd, when he declared the hospital. He said that. But Swami said, no, I am not giving education and healthcare free because people cannot afford it. I am giving education and healthcare free because education and health are not commodities to be traded. They are gifts of God to be given to every individual. And education and health is every individual's purpose. <laughs> Swami's healthcare systems have focused on an integrated care where the body, the mind and the spirit are equally taken care of. And we see in the last 25 years, the two hospitals at Prashantinilam and Vrindavan have given free tertiary level health care to 25 lakh individuals free of cost. And 250, 200 and half lakh surgeries absolutely free of cost at a cost of 700 crores. 700 crores is the cost. If we take the market value, which is at least 20x, because you see how heart care, heart surgeries are done at 5 and 7 lakh rupees, where the actual cost is about 25 to 30,000 rupees, if you see in terms of the cost of the doctors and the equipment related expenses. The actual cost goes up to about 14 to 15,000 crores that has been spent by Swami's institutions for the benefit of mankind. There is no parallel to this healthcare system anywhere in this world. And the best of the doctors from overseas have come and have been aghast as how such healthcare institutions without a billing system can even exist. The second part of health is water. Drinking water supply. See, we take these things for granted because we are in the city of Mumbai. But Swami was born in Anandpur, which is as arid a region as compared to the deserts of Rajasthan. If you see the topographical map of India, the Anandpur district is among the driest districts in Andhra Pradesh and topographically it is at par with the desert region districts of Rajasthan. And for 50 years after independence, the Anandpur district did not have the drinking water supply that it deserved. People had to go miles to get water every single day. And Swami himself was one among them when he stayed in Urakonda and used to go miles every day morning as a small child to get water for his family. He had gone through that himself and he did not want others to go through that and the children of the newer generation to suffer the way he suffered as a child. And so he declared that he will start 
He announced, in fact, he first told Prime Minister Bibi Narasimha Rao in 1993 when he had come to Puttaparthi for an event that the, the Central Trust will sponsor the water supply project. The government of India should take it up. But the government of India had its own priorities. So Swami said, I will take up the project. And in 18 months, in 700 villages and catering to a population of 10 lakh people, Swami supplied free drinking water in their villages where the movement of the tap brings water to their past roads. This is the largest ever drinking water supply project undertaken anywhere in the world outside the government system in 1995 at a cost of 63 million dollars. Do we know that the World Water Forum at Osaka in Mexico ran Swami's drinking water supply project as among the top 10 best local action projects in the world achieving the millennial development goals. See the span at which Swami has worked, the level at which Swami has worked sitting in one corner of India in a God forsaken village which took 7 hours in those years to go by car even from Bangalore and today we have roadways and airways and railways and all ways from all over India reaching Puttaparthi in Swami's life. So that is the span at which and then subsequently the water projects in Godavari, the water project in Medak and Mehbub Nagar, Swami used to mention very joyously, he told once Prof. Sanil Kumar when he was announcing, when Swami completed the water supply project in Medak, Swami told Prof. Sanil Kumar announce Medak district which was the constituency of Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, Swami has provided drinking water supply. Can you imagine the joy and the magnitude of the work that Swami has done that a constituency which belonged to the Prime Minister of India and had water problems was fulfilled by the Satisai Central Trust 50 years after India's independence. That is the level of work that Swami has done in that phase of Vaidya. And the amount of money that Swami spent in the population that benefited is equivalent to 1% of India's population. 1% of India's population taken care of by just one organization, the Shri Satisai Central Trust and Satisai Seva organization. And providing drinking water to people whose population is equivalent to the population of Israel, Bhutan and United Arab Emirates put together. So the Central Trust and Seva organizations have provided drinking water to as many people as there exist in all these three countries put together. You see the scale at which Swami has worked. We sit in our budget room and worship our master out of our love for him. But the master has gone all out and served the multitudes in order to send that message that we have to join him in that task. The last part of Swami's life from 2006 was of establishing of the Sanatana Dharma. If we see the, the commencement of the Atirudra Mahayagnya and Prashanti Nilayam, mark the beginning of that. And all the discourses Swami used to give thereafter focused on the core message. That core message was, I am not the body, I am the soul. I am I, I am I. Do not identify yourself with the body of Swami. Identify yourself with Swami that resides within you. I still remember the Guru Purnima of 2001 when Swami made an announcement which brought tears to everybody's eyes. And that announcement was that from this day I will not give Padmanaska. And what is the reason Swami gave? And this is an unparalleled reason in the history of the Guru Shishya Parampara in India. He said, there is a question of me giving you Padmanaskar when I say that you and I are one. Then who has to give Padmanaskar to whom when we both belong to the same principle and have come from the same principle? That is the level at which Swami wanted to propel us that we are no longer the body, we are no longer individual jivas, we are exactly in reflection of Him. I remember an experience between Swami and Professor Sampar. All the students, Prashantin, students are students. Age, stage, discipline, always a problem. The chemicals in the body we have, that's how Prakriti is. So you are not always able to follow the discipline of the system which Swami used to emphasize so much. But that's where the buddhi which Swami has given, which God has given man, has to be used. So Professor Sampath, who was the Vice Chancellor of the University, was pleading with Swami on behalf of the students. said, Swami, 
please forgive the boys. Swami was not talking to them from long, for many days. He said, Swami, please forgive the boys. After all, they are young students. Swami said, no, I am not angry with them because they are young or old. I am angry with them because they have not been able to understand what my expectations are from them. Then Swami said, Sampath, do you know what I want them to be? He said, no, Swami. He said, I want each one of them to be like me. Being like me does not mean wearing an orange robe and having black hair. Being like me means living an ideal life like I have lived for the last seven decades. That is my expectation from each and every student and each and every devotee in my mission. Unfortunately, they are not able to understand the purpose of what I am telling them and they are carried away by the trivialities of life and the trivialities of the external form. I want each one of them to be Satya Sai Baba in essence. That is the level at which Swami wanted each one of us to preach. So this is Swami's life in brief. In 1950s, Swami started an ashram and in six, for 60 years he showed how an ideal ashram should be run. In the 1960s, he started the Seva organization and for 50 years he showed how an ideal social service organization should be run. In the 1970s, he started the Central Trust and for 40 years he showed how an ideal public charitable trust should run. In 1980s, he started the university and showed for 30 years how an ideal tertiary level integral education system should run. In the 1990s, he started the healthcare system and showed for 20 years how super speciality healthcare should be given free of cost for the totality of the individual. Every aspect of life he has laid before us in action. Can you imagine Swami doing all of these things every single day? Every single day. We always say time problem, time nahi hai, mandir jane ko time nahi hai, bhajan karne ko time nahi hai, baal vikas time nahi hai, narayan seva time nahi hai, we don't have time for anything. Swami had time for all this and Swami had time for doing, uh, for giving darshan every single day morning and evening. Swami had time for participating in bhajan every single day morning and evening. Swami had time to give interviews every single day morning and evening. And He gave 5000 discourses in the process. So if we analyze the summum bonum of what the Master we are talking about is, is without a parallel in the history of mankind, the quantum of work Swami has achieved at the physical level without using any divine power at any level. You see, that's the grandeur of Swami. But at the end of it, what did he say? All of these things is not my mission. When he gave up his family, if you remember that incident when he lost the gold pin, he said this gold pin symbolizes my attachment to the world. On his way to school, Swami had lost his gold collar pin, which was given to him by the mayor of Hampi when he had gone there to Virupaksha with his brother. So Swami said, with the gold pin, my attachment to the family has been lost. And Swami began his mission for the earlier, for the next phase of his life. When he started all these institutions, he said, I am not doing this for myself. This is because I had promised Isharama that I will give healthcare to Puttaparthi, I will give education to Puttaparthi, I will give water to Puttaparthi. All of these things he trivialized. Then what is the core of Swami's avatar? The core of Swami's avatar, what he said, when he, in one of the experiences in 2008, a group of German devotees was sitting in the mandir and after the program, whenever students do programs, at the end of the program they always say, Swami, we love you. So the German devotees that day after the program was over, they said, Swami, we love you. So Swami he said, so when students used to say, Swami used to say, yes, I also love you. That day, so the German devotees thought Swami will say the same to them. That day Swami didn't say that. Swami said, don't love me, love my message. The message of the Master is the Master himself. When Swami had left his physical form, a few of our students had gone to the Himalayas for the Chardham Yatra. In that they met many sages in the Himalayan caves and they were expressing their sorrow and anguish at Swami's departure. And those sages and saints were chiding our students and saying, why are you shedding tears on Swami's Samadhi? Swami was never the body. The avatar is never the body. 
the avatar is the message which he gives and leaves behind as the guiding force for humanity not just for the immediate period but for millennia together it is one bhagavad gita which was given on the battlefield of kurukshetra which inspired us 5000 years later it was one quran given in the caves of arabia muhammad which inspired the 100 pro muslims 1200 years later so we see the impact that these messages have but swami didn't give one gita and one quran and one bible swami gave 5000 discourses because he knew that our capacity is not to understand things in one one text so these many but the kind of effort that we should make in order to read and understand that is this mal probably that's why swami said don't love me love my message so let's go to the next part of my today's talk message what is swami's message swami's message and the guru's message is what is celebrated on the day of gurupur guru the word guru per se stands for can be divided into two parts gu and ru so what is gu in sanskrit swami used to say gukaro andhakarasya gu stands for the darkness rukaro tanivartakah the one who removes the darkness of ignorance from our lives is the guru not the one who gives you mantra not the one who in fashionable cars and fashionable institutions established around tells you the way of life the one who removes the darkness of ignorance from your lives and gives you the wisdom of the truth that you are not different from the guru himself and from the supreme principle that is the guru. and the swami always used to say who is the guru again in that two parts gu and ru and one of our aunties here when i said gu she said gunatita yes gunatita so the guru is the one who is beyond the three gunas and ru is rupa varjita the guru is the one who does not have any form so the true guru is god himself we learn this famous verse in sanskrit from our childhood guru brahma guru vishnu guru devo maheshwara guru saksha par brahma tasmay shri gurave namaha what is the translation we are told that guru is brahma guru is vishnu guru is shiva guru is maheshwara guru is saksha par brahma swami said no no that is not the translation the real translation is brahma is guru vishnu is guru shiva is guru saksha para brahma is guru because only they qualify for these two qualities or the lack of them they neither have gunas nor do they have a form they are principles shiva is not the one which is painted by uh, some always to say ravi varma's paintings are not what shiva and vishnu are standing with four hands and shankha chakra gada padma or the trishula and the damaruka that is only an imagination the message what is the message what does the trishula stand for that he is beyond past present and future he is beyond the three gunas he is beyond the three qualities all of these things are as what is damaruka sound he is the master of sound what is the lotus in vishnu's hand symbolize that he is embodiment of all beauty what is the message of the gada in his hand that the moment he raises it you know what will happen what happened to all the great demons i think the names of all demons have been attached to god because we can know the power that he has that's the whole symbolism behind all of this so for example madhusudan the name madhu is the name of a demon sudana is the one who has killed him right kaitabhari is another name kaitaba is the name of a demon hari is the enemy of kaitaba so what is the meaning of that these are very powerful demons but the power of god is even greater than them that he can finish them off. so this symbolism that's why brahma vishnu and shiva are the two the next point swami said what is the symbolism of guru purnima why purnima why night bharatiya sanskruti is actually sunlight day time sanskruti why night related night related the symbolism because the moon reflects the light of the sun similarly each one of the moon is connected to the mind so the message of guru purnima is that just like 
the moon reflects the light of the sun and spreads beauty around. The true disciple, the true devotee reflects the light of the buddhi and the atma which is really the guru himself. Not the light of the mind, not the light of the senses, but the light of the atma and the buddhi. Because these two are God's gift to mankind. That is the quality which animals don't have. Animals live by instincts. That's why they said that we are the crest jewel of creation. Jantu naam narajanma durlakam. Amongst 84 lakh species, man is a crest jewel. Why? Man means human beings. By the way, man is, means the one who has mind is man. Man does not mean man by gender. Man means the one who has mind. Even women have mind. So that's why the word man, so Swami's all discourses, Swami used the word man has to do this, man has to do this. And when Swami said man and they, the one who has manas is man. So, once my grandfather had got an interview, Professor Chandra Asha, who was a professor in Bombay University, it was a Thursday and he had an interview with Swami, he said Swami, today is Thursday, I accept you as my guru, please bless me. And Swami said, no, 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 I am not your guru. Then he touched his heart and he said, Your conscience is your guru. Always follow your conscience. So that is the message of Guru Purnima. And that message has to be practiced every single day. Guru Purnima over, celebrations over, contemplation over, efforts over. Guru Purnima over, celebrations over, work begins now. And that's why every year these festivals keep coming again and again to remind us of the objectives that the spiritual life has placed before us. How can we express this love that Swami stands for? We express this love by giving back to Swami that love. And that love is often called Bhakti. I have 5 minutes, 10 minutes? Okay. So Bhakti, so love, basically love. So I missed one point in my earlier explanation. If Swami is not omniscience, if Swami is not miracles, if Swami is not all these institutions that has been established, then what is Swami? If it is about institutions, so many institutions have been established by so many philanthropists. Those Swami's approach was totally different. If Swami is miracles, miracles happen, they continue to happen. If Swami is omniscience, the sages of your had all the omniscience, Vasishta, Vyasa, Vishwamitra, Valmiki, all the four V's. We have known their story, how capable they were. They were capable of creating another heaven for Trishanku. They were capable of swallowing the entire Narmada in their Kamandalu. That is the power they have. They are capable of sitting in their ashram and seeing about the Mahabharata war and writing down what's happening. So the sages and saints have it. Then why did this Vasishta, Vishwamiti, Valmiki and Vyasa want to be born or want to live when Rama and Krishna are going to come? Because it is not omniscience, it is not miracles, it is not the establishment of institutions which defines the avatar. What defines the avatar is his love. It is the presence, the overpowering presence of Swami that we experience which has no substitute. You cannot, you cannot describe it. You can experience it. That's why Vasishta had stayed in Dashatas in the Ayodhya court for several generations so that when Rama comes in the human form, he will be able to benefit from it. Same with Gaga, same with Vishwamitra, we see that across the board. So that love is what Swami's true core principle is. And that love is what we have to offer back to Swami. Now how do we offer that love to Swami that also he has shared? Love, everybody has. We all have love. Actually Swami used to say, there is no atheist in the world. Everybody is a devotee. Only thing is, whose devotee they are, that is the difference. When the love is transformed to the world or the prakriti, that is called raga, attachment, family, friends, nature, car, house. You love them, right? That is also love. The same heart gives the same love feeling. But that is raga. That binds you. The same love when, when channelized towards God becomes bhakti. That liberates you. Swami always used to give the example of the key. I have listened to this example dozens of times in Swami's presence. But it was just a year ago I really understood the meaning. Key is the same. 
The moment you insert it in the lock, if you turn it one way, it will close the lock. If you turn the other way, it will open the lock. Love is the same. The moment you channelize it to the world, it will bind you. The moment you channelize it towards God, it will liberate you. So if we want to truly offer anything to Swami, that offering has to be that of love. Now how? And I'd like to refer to the, to the Navabhita Bhakti, which Swami had spoken about innumerable times, but is often misinterpreted because we limit it to the scriptural examples. So the first example is that of Shavadam. And what example Swami used to give is that of Parikshit. We know all the we narrated this story to the Balmika children. The aunties are so more receptive, they are nodding their head because they know all that the Balmika's book still is being validated. But here, the, the, my uncles here are wondering what is he saying. He thought he would share some spicy experiences in Swami's interview room and Swami's Kodai Canal experiences. Here he is telling us about the scriptures. Because we have all grown in Swami's mission for the last 50 years. Can we be in primary school all our life? We have to move to secondary school. So you have to start, Swami used to say, start from the primary school of miracles and move to the secondary school of, of message. Pass out from the secondary school of message and move to the university of experience. And then pass out of the university of experience and then move to the PhD degree of self-realization. You, when do you get the highest degree? When you are able to analyze the message of the master. When Shankaracha, Ad Shankaracharya wrote Ashrams on the Brahma Sutra, that's when God of Allah said yes. Now you are ready to spread the message. Now you are ready to participate in the revival of Sanatana Dharma. Till then even Ad Shankaracharya was not given the opportunity to progress in the journey for which he was born. So what does that mean? We are still in the primary school. We have so much more to go before we can say that yes, we have the right to be foot soldiers in Swami's mission. So that's why this miracles and experiences form part of this sweet story, but the core is the message. And I will share a relevant experiences also. So the example of Shavana is of Parikshita. In one week, by listening to Shuka, after the curse from Shri, he was liberated. Why? Because he was not just listening. He had become one with what he was listening. How many times all of us have listened to the Bhagavatam? Dozens of times. How many times have you listened to Swami's discourses? Scores of times. How many times have you got liberated? Swami used to always joke with the students. Buddha saw the four sides just once of the dead man, of the sick man, of the old man, and sage. sage. See that? The boys are listening. So happy. Good job. So he saw these four sides only once. And renunciation built up in him, and he moved ahead of the path. And Swami should tell us in Kodaganal, all of you have seen these four sides dozens of times. There is no iota of renunciation in you at all. How many dead people you saw, how many sick people you saw, how many old people you saw, and how many sages you have seen. Has an iota of renunciation entered into your life and your priorities? No. That's why Buddhas are venerated. And you are all Buddhus. <laughs> That's why Swami always used to say in Telugu, Buddhi ledu. He will not say manas ledu, chitta ledu, he will not say that. He will say buddhi ledu, because buddhi is the most important discriminating factor which tells us what we should do. When we don't use it, we don't have buddhi. When we use it, we become the buddha. So that is the objective of shavanam. You have to, we have to become one with it. The example of Ramakrishna Paramahamsa and Rani Rasmani Devi. I don't know whether you heard that or not. Swami used to narrate that many times. Rasmani was the owner of the temple in which Ramakrishna used to work as a priest. And when one day Ramakrishna was giving a talk like this, Rasmani was sitting there towards the end. So Ramakrishna walked all the way to Rasmani by giving the talk and went and sat there. So all the people were stunned. 
Anyway, they thought Ramakrishna has some mental problem because he used to go into the samadhis. So how do you know that he is genuine or not? Now we know because we have so much of literature. Those times people used to visit him once in a while, they thought that he is not normal. So he has gone mad, he slapped his own boss. That was also Rani, that was also an old lady. Ramakrishna told her, if you want to discuss, if you want to think, sorry, about your legal problems while sitting in my satsanga, please get out. So she was sitting in the satsanga and instead of doing shavadam of what was going on there, she was thinking about her legal problems. This is the problem with shavadam. Swami always used to say, you are sitting in the puja altar in your home, but your mind is on, though we will come in five minutes, Isriwala will come, Bajiwala should give me five rupees, yesterday Chutta I did not have. <laughs> you have an appointment with God in your altar, why are you worried about Isriwala, Bajiwala and Gopi? That has to be the focus which you have to have, 100%. So that is Shavanam. Next is Kirtanam. We think singing the word God's glory is Kirtana. Shuka is the example of that song used to give. You are singing the glory with so much of joy and so much of tanmayata, oneness with the story that the listener like Parikshita is liberated. So, Swami said, how many of you all are singing bhajans like this? Many people come into the bhajan all thinking they are going to give a kacheri performance. Everybody will listen to the bhajan, after bhajan they go out and say, Aray, you sang very well. Aray, your tabla was great. Aray, that curve you gave like that was brilliant. Swami said, you are not coming here for giving musical performance. The bhava with which you do kirtanam has to bring that transformation in the listeners. That is what she taught it. That is your bhakti to Him. That is your love for Him that pours through your sadhana of Kirtanam. And Swami used to, and Swami told us, in, so I will cover that in the next point. The third is Vishnu Smaranam. Sarvada Sarva Kaleshu Sarvatra Harichintanam. That is Vishnu Smaranam. Everywhere, every time, all the time. It need not be 